Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Taste of Innovation, Unlocking Artisanal Potential on the Farm. So I'm delighted to have you all here today as we embark on this journey into the fascinating world of artisanal food production. So before we dive into the discussion, I'd like to take a moment to introduce my colleague and guest speaker, Dr. Deirdre Kennedy. Morning, Deirdre. How are you? Morning. How's all? Great to have you here, Deirdre. So Deirdre is a, an absolute powerhouse in the field of artisan and small food sector research. She's based at a renowned Chagas Food Research Centre in Moor Park. So she brings a wealth of experience and uh, to our webinar here today. So Deirdre has a great passion for arts and food production, and uh, she has a great understanding of the intricacies of this industry. And she's very, been very instrumental in guiding many farmers and food producers towards success. So Deirdre is dedicated to fostering innovation, sustainability and collaboration with the agri-food community. Um, so before I, I start, I just I want to emphasize the importance of uh, make, making this a very enriching and dynamic discussion. So throughout the session, we're going to encourage you to actively engage by utilizing the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any burning questions or anecdotes that you want to share or any insights that you want to contribute, we'd, we want to hear from you. So after all, it's the questions that spark the most enlightening discussions here so uh, and makes the success of this webinar. So Deirdre, I know you've prepared a, a presentation for us here today and you're, you're, based, you're based in Moor Park, as we say. Um, yeah. you're, you're supporting people who are trying to diversify into artisan food production. And I know you're part of a, a much wider team and there's lots more resources and you'll be telling us a bit about that. You just yeah. might tell us about your, your own background yourself um, you're, I know you're, yeah. you have a PhD as well, and uh, then we go into your your presentation after that. Sure. Yeah, I suppose I um I studied food science technology in college, um and I went on. I did a PhD in kind of food safety and microbiology. Um, I suppose I changed it up a little bit. I came to Moor Park and I started working um on the production side of things. I was in the food chemistry and technology department for about ten years, so got some great experience there. Maybe working with some of the maybe some of the bigger companies. Um, I ran the food structure, um, food microstructure laboratories for a number of years as well. So got good, got good in, I suppose, understanding of um, food formulations and that kind of side of things. So I'm only actually in this role just over a year. So new enough to the, the kind of small producers, that kind of area, but yeah. um, learning loads. And it's it's fantastic. And it's it's, it's really it's really diverse role. I really love it. So, yeah. And your predecessor was Eddie O'Neill in this whole area. Many yeah. might know Eddie uh, from the past. But, yeah. yeah. You'll be blazing that trail after after Eddie. Oh God, yeah, big shoes to fill. He's a fantastic <laughs> man. I still deal with him from time to time. So, you know, he's still working a bit. Um, he's been a good mentor to me, and you know, he's still working. We still have some shared clients and things like that. So, um, he's a great. He's been a great resource um, for me to, to to leverage as well. So, very good. Well, if you want to tr uh, share your screen there, Deirdre, please. And we and as I say, anybody that you have questions there, you can put your questions in the Q and A for Deirdre. Um, obviously. It's, people diversifying into many different areas, you know, whether it's into producing chutneys or jams or preserves or uh, adding value to their milk by maybe setting up vending machines, um, cheese cheese production, um, chocolate making, bread making. So Deirdre will take us through um, all those different areas and the supports Chagas can provide in those areas. Okay, Deirdre, off you go. Thank you. Great stuff. So thank you very for the introduction, I suppose, and, and welcoming here today. So excited to share, you know, just... I suppose I'll talk you through a, just a real, real brief overview of this this world of artisanal food, kind of maybe how I would get started if it was something I was interested in. So the main body of my presentation will be how the Chagas Food Industry Development um, the supports that we provide, supports available maybe from other agencies and that sort of thing. And we'll finish off just with a couple um, of examples and case studies. Um, so just wanted to introduce, I suppose, this, uh, the term artisanal food or artisan foods. So we're, I think it's a very, very positive thing that it's actually protected in this country. So, um, you know, you have to meet the, the criteria set out here in this guide. I won't get too much into this. You can find all this information on this FCI guide. This note. But along with the terms farmhouse, traditional and natural, um, this labeling protection and marketing protection is really, really good. And it was it was it was brought into place in 2016, I think. And this was um, in a response to the growth of farmers markets and the retail interest in local produce, which is a trend we're seeing and a trend I hope that we continue to see, especially with this, you know, sustainability circular economy, short supply chain thing that's kind of happening at the minute. Um, and I love this um, description by Irish food writer John McKenna, where he talks about the personality the place, the product, and the passion. And there certainly are four words that we would associate with um, this artisan food sector in Ireland. 
So if you think it's something you might like to get into, I would sit down and ask yourself a few questions. You know, is there something really, really novel that you, you want to produce? You know, is, is it unique and marketable in that way? Maybe I have a real interest in a certain type of food. Maybe I have something to leverage, like such as milk or a crops that, I, that I'd like to you know, make food out of. Where am I going to sell it? So it's important to, you know, have a, have a look around. Are other people selling similar products? Is there people, is there local farm shops? Is there local farmers markets that would sell your product? What supports do I need? So everybody needs some support. I might be really good at making my product, but I'm not very good at selling it. I might be a very good entrepreneur in that way, but I don't know anything about food science. Um, there are supports out there, and I'll talk you through a lot of them today. Um, and then where am I going to produce this? So I suppose when we're talking about farm diversification, a lot of people would maybe convert outbuildings and stuff like that to be suitable food premises. Um, but if not, where, where else can I do it? And where would I get started maybe in producing it? So kind of in conjunction with that, all food businesses will have to register with a relevant authority. It will depend on the type of food that you're producing. My advice at this stage is to engage as absolutely as early as possible in your journey with your local, I suppose, authority, whoever's going to be your future inspector. They can get it, um, involved at an early stage and then guide you. So there's no point in you going and resurfacing floors or, you know, ceilings whatever you're doing to your outbuildings and then they come along and say well it's actually not up to spec engage with them as absolutely as early as possible and they can guide you on your journey it, you know work in cooperation with them I suppose at this stage you know there's no point in saying that it's not you know can get a bit daunting there's a lot of relevant legislation there's a lot of requirements around food safety you're likely going to have to do some training put in place hassle price and it can be I suppose a little bit daunting for people who don't have that kind of scientific background so I would say at this stage, you know, you know, you have to kind of muddle through this and, you know, get on board with it and seek whatever help you need. There's some great like food safety consulting um, consultants and things like that out there that can really, really help at this stage. So how can Chagas help? I suppose in our food program, we have five departments. So we've got a wealth of knowledge across all different types of products. My department, the food industry development, we are based across three different sites. Um, the sites being, you can see here in Dublin, is our National Prepared Consumer Food Centre in Chagas Ashdown. So I am based at the Chagas Research Centre in Moor Park, County Cork. We also have a pilot plant there, Moor Park Technology Limited, and the National Food Innovation Hub. And over in the west is our new is the new B Innovator Campus, and that's based at the Chagas Athenry site. So first of all, we will start with Moor Park. Um, down in Fermoy County Cork. So the very first building you see up there on the slide, that is our National Food Innovation Hub. So this is kind of rented office and lab space for kind of some of the bigger names. I suppose a lot of the bigger companies that may have come through Moor Park over the years and now kind of have a base there. Moor Park itself would be known, I suppose, predominantly for its dairy research, certainly not limited to, but there'd be a lot of different, there'd be a lot of great research going on in a lot of these different um, areas. I suppose just the point I'm going to make here is that, you know, because there's so much different, diverse and fantastic research going on, I have access to the laboratories, facilities and expertise associated with all these areas. So if there's things that people come to me and I don't know, there, there might be someone in the building that can guide me, you know, to what I, what we need to know to help these small producers. So that's me at our last Moor Park open day. So I would deal with, I suppose, the, the smaller producers and just naturally being in Moor Park and the dairy, the farm diversification would be, would be part of my role. Um, so I had just deal with um, regular food producers as well. I run the, the farmhouse cheese making course and a few other bits. I also support scale up facilities at our um, pilot plant, which is Moor Park Technology Limited, I'm going to talk a bit more about in a minute. So that photo down there at the bottom, that's our, our latest group that came through our um, QQI certified farmhouse cheese production course. So just, I think, a great example of why I'm down there in Moor Park. I'm the, the experts on the cheese making are guys from the food chemistry and technology department. And here we all are using the facilities then at our pilot plant just you know, a few yards across the road. So just a great example of the kind of collaborations that we do down in Moor Park. So our pilot plant, I just, we just saw, you know, the cheese hall there in that last slide, but it's, I suppose it's a joint venture between Chagas and um, the Irish dairy industry. So it's, it, you know, it's managed a little bit separately. It's managed separately to our, our food program and such, but there's huge, huge collaborations. I certainly would have a lot of shared clients um, and so would a lot of the researchers and, you know, the, the some of the, the customers in the hub they would all use this this pilot plant we, we would share a lot of um we'd work together a lot i suppose um the type of work that goes on is to do a lot of liquid handling you know they would have a lot of the traditional you know the the pasteurizers evaporators and so on lots of different drying technologies um fermentation a big cheese hall um any sort of sort of food formulation kind of stuff can be done um just a, an example of some of the product types uh, 
um, they would be heavy, you know, they would be heavily involved in the dairy products and powders and dairy ingredients. And now I suppose in recent years, more than the, the non-dairy, you know, equivalents like the, pro, the, the protein powders and, and all this kind of work going on there as well. So this slide, not to be going, I won't go into too much detail here. All I wanted to just make a point is that we can do things like basically at any scale between ourselves and more practical technology limited. You want to come into me and you want to do a low risk we'll do 10, 20, 30 litres and make a batch or something. Um, we can then go and scale it up. We have actually got two different pilot plants um, at two different scales. Everything is on wheels. Everything's interchangeable. We can recreate all different kinds of scenarios. We can get different product processes in place. And I suppose that's naturally what a pilot plant is. Um, you know, it, like, as I said, I've had, I've had a lot of customers who've come to me. We might do something in small scale, kind of like a kitchen scale or so on. And then we can translate, if we can um, recreate that then at a kind of a pilot plant level. And I suppose when I'm working, you know, with customers and bringing them into MTL, I try to recreate maybe the kind of scenario that they might be able to recreate themselves in their own um, setup that they're, that they're planning on, on doing. Maybe they're planning on investing in a couple of different tanks or a couple of different bits of equipment. I'll try and recreate what they will eventually be doing at home. And, it, as, and then they come in, they get to see, I suppose, the type of equipment that they might need to invest in or how they would do things, how long it would take them. And it's great for getting that kind of initial kind of prototypes up and going, up and running. Um, while we're still talking about more pack, I just wanted to introduce our new um, bio innovation suite. So when I'm talking about bio innovation, I'm talking about all things fermentation. OK, so this is, a, I suppose, a huge trend at the minute um, in artisan food. So we have a new fermentation technologist. That's Dr. John Leach. So John is a fantastic scientist, but he's also really, really Okay, with all the kind of artisan food side of, of the fermented artisan foods and stuff. So he um, is going to be running this centre. The link is there on the bottom of the page if you want to take a look. But I suppose it's funded by SFI and it's going to be you know, used in research. But it's, they're also very, very willing to working with industry or small producers. They're looking at ideas of, I suppose, fermenting you know, waste streams. And of course, the normal value added stuff like the kefirs and the kombuchas and so on. And they also we now also have this scale up facility based in More Park Technology Limited on the the fermentation side of things. So there's a, going to be a great link there and a great service there going forward. I suppose, again, this slide, I suppose, um, pertains to the Bio of Innovation Suite, but it's, it's, I think it's really kind of a representative of, of all of our centres and all of our, our services. So we can help with product development. We have the capabilities and the laboratories and things on site to test things, you know, to optimise things for people, and then we can scale it up. And that's really where we come in. You know, it's, it's a great summary slide of kind of our approach to helping people getting kind of prototype products up and running and so on. So I'll go over to the East and our National Prepared Consumer Food Centre in Dublin. OK, so I like you think consumer food. So I suppose anything, you know, that you'd be packaging up like sauces, you know, um, hummus, jams, these kind of things. They have a great packaging suite. There's great expertise on site there, meat, cereals, dry products and so on. So again, we're kind of at two different scales. Um, development kitchen there in the first photo and I suppose a larger pilot plant processing hall there that you see an example of the second photo. Um, so the Prepared Consumer F Food Centre was really well thought out. It's only established since 2018. And as well as all these, like I suppose this, this the processing and the advanced kind of you know technologies and so on they also have access to things like sensory science suites food safety suites and not and not just the the i suppose the suites but actually the the, the researchers and the experts associated with that all kind of under one roof which is really fantastic that you could follow your product through and, and look at shelf life and so and so on so anything kind of consumer food anything people that need help with packaging or shelf life i would a lot of those kind of queries will go towards towards our ashtown center Again, I said they have some great advanced technologies and they're doing some great research up there as well. Do some great collaborations. They're doing some great research on sustainable packaging and waste failureization and, and all these kind of using all these kind of technologies and so on. Um, so we'll go over to the West, um, our BIA, the, the BIA Innovator Campus. Um, this place is fantastic. It, it's, it's just newly opened. So it really is this one stop shop, this one stop shop for all things Artisense SME support. Um, on site, there's two Chagas in-house food technologists, so they will be kind of similar to myself, the similar kind of roles. So they're there to help with the technical side of things. They also have, I suppose, a whole team that can help with the other side of things, the business side of things, and so on. I suppose I just wanted to take a look, if you take a look here um, on the left-hand side of this slide, just to highlight, I suppose, new producers, small producers. 
where you might where you might fit in, in in such a fantastic campus. So they have these four co-working kitchens. So meat, general, dairy, and food and seafood. So these are actually fully kitted out kind of processing halls that you can go in and rent, like rent pay per use. So you can rent it for a day or a couple of days and so on. And you know that that's very very important. I think to to new producers to have that um, facilities that you can go in and try out things, and you don't even you know. You can even use the equipment is, is already there on site. And you also have the technical support of the Jagas Food Technologists. Um, as I suppose as companies start to grow, they also offer starter units and growth units. So these would be own door kind of units that people can rent for, for a number of years. And that's kind of to support people's growth. What really, really sets this place apart, though, I think, is, is kind of the extra. So they have fantastic facilities in terms of they have a culinary training center, it's a fantastic buyer showcasing room. We can see here um, auditorium, audiovisual room. They have podcast studio. They have fantastic networking area. So, you know, no small companies would ever have these. But if you're inside in the BIA community, you can use these facilities, even if you just need them a couple of times a year or so on. So they're, it's fantastic to have these shared facilities at everyone's fingertips. And again, another thing that's amazing, I think, is the fact that they're all going to be there under one roof. So there's a lot of small and medium producers all going to be together and, um, you know, sharing these spaces and so on. So hopefully you get some great collaborations coming out of that, um, that centre as it grows over the years. Uh, one last um, centre I just want to highlight that we have in Chagas, I suppose, it's, it's actually not in our food program it's, it's in our crops program in Oak Park but it's the National Centre for Brewing and Distilling and again it's this kind of pilot plant setup you can see some of the pictures down below there so it's only um, newly established you know I suppose it was it was established to to kind of research the the value potential of Irish grains and there's a fantastic lady up there uh, Lisa Ryan and she's been doing some great work with the local colleges she's been doing training courses for different groups and you know just general kind of consultation for the industry and I think you know, with this rise of kind of microbreweries and so on um, in this, you know, in this sector, I think it's great that Chagas will have that support going forward. I just want to direct people to a few different places, again, just to, um, you know, if they're thinking of getting started in, in a food business. So that's both the, the entire rural economy um, website se section of our website is quite good. Um, there is um, a dedicated section to artisan food, and there are these fact sheets there, which are just basic two, three pages of kind of, if I'm thinking about starting a food business, you know, I'm thinking about making this, the kind of the basics will be there, what, what you would need to do and um, what you might need to invest in and so on. So they're just a nice place if people are just kind of initially having a think. There's some um, some documents there that might help. Um, we as a department, we run a lot of training courses. So the, the link to the website is there. Um, so keep an eye on this because it does get updated, you know, as dates come on stream and so on. So I think for this small producers, artisan producers, there's a great course, Microbiology for Non-Microbiologists. So that is a really good one, I think, um, for people that maybe that don't have this scientific background and your, you know, your health inspector or your, your ag inspector is telling you to send these samples for, for micro and you don't know why you're sending them and you don't know why you're cleaning things in a certain way and you don't know why you're doing this and that, that and the other. Um, that really kind of gives people an understanding um, of, you know, as well keeping your food safe and why you're sending foods for testing and so on. I suppose as your business grows, there's something like the new product development course or the sensory courses are fantastic ways um, to learn about those topics. We also have product specific courses. So um, butchering course, manufactured chocolate. And as I, I mentioned this previously, the farmhouse cheese making course. So this course is QQI level six certified. So it's, you know, it's it's quite, it's, I'd say not for the faint hearted. It, it's, it's a really good, it's kind of an intense course on all things cheese making. And we touch upon, you know, not, not just the science, but, you know, kind of the practical side of things, um, you know, and the legal side of things and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's a great one to do if, it, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, I suppose for anyone really, really wanting to, to go back and study, we have um, my people thinking about, oh, I'd like to go back, you know, into education, but I'm interested in food and I'm not sure what I'll do. So the UCC do run a diploma in specialty in arts and food production. So it's it's a part time level seven diploma. Um, so, you know, it, it's part time, like kind of October to June. So that is, you know, totally aimed at this sector, this small food and artisan kind of sector. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the grant supports that are available. So a lot of people start off with these guys. So these are the Enterprise Ireland Innovation Vouchers. So 5,000 euros. So if you look at the last line here on this slide, 
to be exchanged for knowledge transfer projects from the knowledge provider. So we would be the knowledge provider. So there's also lots of the, the colleges and other agencies are knowledge providers. And what it, it doesn't, it's not 5,000 euro to spend any which way you like, it's 5,000 euro um, to spend gaining knowledge from us. So it, it, it's about our time. It's about coming to us and spending time on our premises or maybe us coming out to you. Um, so it, it's in exchange for, for our time. So that's that's kind of, um, you know, that's where those vouchers are, are spent. And, you know, a lot of kind of new producers would, would come to us through, through with, you know, with those grants. I um, just want to introduce, I suppose, talk about the, our, everybody's local enterprise office. So um, the local enterprise office, again, it's another thing I would recommend doing at a very, very early stage in your journey, even if you're only thinking about starting up this business or you have a business idea. So for the very early stages, they would have these, I suppose, business advice clinics. So you kind of one to one advice clinics and, um, you know, if they take you on as a client and they feel like you could benefit from some mentoring, they might assign you a mentoring, you know, a mentor might be you know, someone who's retired from the area or someone who's, you know, um, you know, food consultants and so on. So they might, they can assign you business mentors to kind of help you with your journey. And we would kind of sometimes deal with, with business mentors. We might, you know, refer people over and back to each other and so on. Um, as your business kind of gets up and running, they do have um, these kind of mainstream grants, which I, I, won't, I won't talk too much about, but this would be all value added. It'd be all, this would be all on your value added products. This is nothing to do with primary agriculture or anything like that. It would be on your, your, your value added um, product business. They run very, very specific food sector um, supports. So um, you see here the first two things, Digital School of Food and Food Starter Program. These to me are an absolute no brainer. They're, they're a must, they're, 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 they're quick. They're, there's a very little cost or time associated with them. They are fantastically done. They're set up and they're ready to go. Um, they're just two kind of, I suppose, training courses as such, or, you know, kind of mentoring courses for people who are thinking about getting into um, starting a food business. So if you were to progress in your journey and start going down Food Academy or start applying for other grants within the local enterprise office, there's a strong chance it would be a prerequisite that you've already done these courses. So I think they're, they're, they're something for anybody with a food business to do at, at starting out. Um, they then run the Food Academy, which is, you know, if you, once you have a kind of a product established, you know, kind of grow through super value and the likes. Um, and then as business grows, I suppose the other mainstream grants some people apply for as well. Um, I suppose I also just want to direct people to um, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland website. So this is a great resource, I think, for people. You know, you're a bit overwhelmed and you don't know, you know, what, 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 am, I, what am I going to have to comply with? Who, who do I contact? What do I do? You know, what, what are my requirements? So there is some great um, advice and, and some just, you know, very good resources and publications on the Food Safety Authority of Ireland website. I think it's the best way to kind of and get anything, you know, I suppose from them. It, it, they have it all laid out really, really well on their website. There's two publications I just want to draw attention to, again, just given the nature of the webinar for, there is a guide, a guide to food law for artisan small food producers, and then this village market handbook. So for people kind of looking at getting involved in farmers markets and so on. Okay, just finish up with two case studies, two, I suppose, two client stories, I suppose. Um, you can look this lady up online. So. Salt Rock Dairy. So um, I know Barry, you had the the webinar a couple of weeks ago on, on the milk vending machine. So Catherine started out um, with, you know, she installed a pasteurizer on her premises and she has her milk vending machine. Um, she's really, really big into kind of, um, you know, short supply chain circular economy, that kind of sustainability. So she has her, she, you know, she has her, her reusable glass bottles. People come along, they fill, they refill their bottles and she, put the, uh, the milk vending machine on a, on a movable trailer and she moves it around the area. So seven days a week, it, it, you know, it, it's in different locations and she catches a lot of customers that way. So she's at the, the farmer's market in Gory and people start to say to her, you know, no, I, when are you going to make make a video? I heard you make, do you make butter? Do you do this, do that? So she starts to think, oh God, you know, there, there is actually kind of a market there for me to produce different kinds of products. And farmer's markets are great for this. They're great for people starting out and seeing, you know, does the local, I suppose the local people kind of support your business? Is, is there kind of um, a need there for, for your products and so on? So she came to me and we have been working on, I suppose, different products. Um, she, there's a picture of her there last week in, in, more, in, in MTL and making butter in our 100 liter um, churn in MTL. So she soft launched four new products at her farmer's market stall last weekend and it went well. So she, I suppose she's an example, I suppose, of where people came along. They, someone came along to me. We, 
So they had their Enterprise Ireland Innovation Voucher. We got to the small scale. We, we developed recipes. Um, she then got another Enterprise Ireland Innovation Voucher and was able to use that to produce these kind of prototypes um, and she can test the market that way. So we're not really set up for people to be coming in every day producing out of here. It probably wouldn't pay you to do that. But if you can use your vouchers initially and your grants to sort of get your get your prototypes and, and you know, test your market, that, that's what we're there to get people kind of off the ground that way. Um, so she now knows what it would take or what she needs to invest in, what, what, what equipment she might she might buy you know I know a lot of people going back to things to Leo's and leader and things like that it's great for you to be able to say you know I've I've made this product already in more park I've done this course I've done you know I now have these prototypes um, and this is what I want to do going forward so that's kind of where we come in just to kind of get people off the ground initially um, another client of mine another fantastic lady Anne-Marie so you can have a look at their website there so she came to Chagas a few years back, I suppose, uh, to Eddie initially. Um, her family farm has a beetroot crop. I know she kind of identified it as this kind of superfood um, that, you know, it, you know, a kind of a, a good, um, I suppose, a good product that, that people might buy based on that. So she, they got it up and running, I suppose, through um, a co-manufacturer, the Apple Farm in Care. Um, she then I suppose it works it worked through MTL to produce, I suppose if you see this this second bottle here um, on the right hand side, this is a concentrated kind of version of her beetroot juice. So this is actually something it's it's I suppose it's it's a drink that's high in nitrates and this is something that athletes look for before a big event. So she's been selling that to um, I suppose a specific market, a market that she identified herself because she's she's sort of she's in the know with all this. She's she's into this herself, so um, she's been that that's been I suppose a kind of a niche product that she might only produce now and again, where she's producing the the beetroot juice the whole time. She then I suppose with the success of her first um, phase of her or I suppose first phase of her business, she was able to go back to local enterprise office, and she's now secured a feasibility grant for sort of the next phase of what she wants to do. So she's working. With us in Moor Park and in Ashtown um, on drying, drying her products, so drying her waste stream and her main product, and see if there's kind of, I suppose it's feasibility grant. So is it going to be feasible? Is it going to work out? And that's, I suppose, that's what the grants are there to help her with, just to kind of explore and see, you know, can she value add to to her waste streams and, you know, produce dry products that way. So a quick, quick summary. Um, just a sum up because I know there was kind of a lot in there so if you do have your product concept you know have a think about it reach out to, to similar producers reach out to ourselves you know is it is it going to be possible is it something that could work and um, if you want to go ahead with it there's there's supports out there I think I've, I hope that I've outlined to people the both the technical and financial support that um, you know that to make sure you, you seek as much as you possibly can and I suppose at all times be aware of what you're going to have to do to be compliant and um, engage with your relevant authority. And the FSI website is a great, um, I suppose, a great place to just start there, seeing your journey. So I might leave this slide up just for a minute, Barry, if that's okay. Um, this is just, I suppose, I should have said this at the start. I said I'd share the details of all the different centers and the contacts for the different centers here um, at the end. Um, if anyone wants to grab a, a photograph or take a screenshot or something of this, these are the contact details. If you're interested in any of the different sites or the different areas, this is how, how you would get in touch with the relevant person, people. So that's, uh, that's it really for me. Yeah, so I'm um, happy to take, I have the rest of the, the session for questions. Yeah, thanks for that. Can you hear me okay there? I sure can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. sorry. Off there for about maybe 15 minutes because the electricity went in in Longford Town Centre here where I am at the moment and in the yeah. office I have to join you on my phone so it's a bit it's a it's a small bit awkward and seeing the questions and getting to you as well but uh, yeah thanks Amelia for that Deirdre I know you give a very good presentation here as well and uh, unfortunately just didn't get to see everything there so look at as I can I send it out yeah and we will show your presentation afterwards uh, and and with this this uh, is this session is being recorded as well so even the bit i missed there i'll be able to see it afterwards so deirdre uh we'll just maybe some some questions there for you there um just to maybe uh you know can you give us maybe some practical steps that you can take to add value to food produced on the farm so what would be the practical steps that you would be recommending to people um 
I suppose it really it depends on what what you're thinking. If you obviously the, the, the main thing would be what, what you already have. Like if you're a dairy farmer and you already have milk, um, you know, the next step, you know, what 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 do I want to produce a dairy product? Um, you know, a lot of people that diversify will definitely I suppose I deal mostly with, with the dairy dairy side of things. I suppose they're kind of they don't like to be, you know, always at the mercy of the co-op prices and this, that and the other, so that they go along and, and they think oh what what do I need to do to to add this I mean it's not an easy road I think there's you know there's a couple of years of kind of hard work and investment and so and so on in it um it would depend on what scale you're looking at as well so um like for example I would have some people that maybe that say oh I you know I have dairy farm I, I'd like to make ice cream but they've no idea that they need cream so cream is, is quite a, a you know a quite an expensive product so but there might be somebody local that supplied them with cream as opposed to buying you know the, buying at a full price so it, it really would depend on, on the situation um i would say reach out to people around you you know reach out to kind of the, the most local the local farm shops or the farmers market see what's kind of selling what, what other people can do is there anything you can buy directly off people is there anything you can you can collaborate with and anything you also anything you can use yourself of your own your own ingredients would be would be the, the starting point for sure so the, uh, so the first thing you really have to assess your resources and the capabilities that you have. You know, so you, you're looking, you're assessing what your farm resources are, maybe including your land, your equipment, your workforce, yeah. uh, and your infrastructure. Well, absolutely, and, and and like the value that you put on your own time is important. You can see that with a lot of people. You know, they're 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 working hard. You know, they might say, "Oh, I have the you know the raw ingredient," but you know they don't often put enough value on their own on their own time. You know, so it's important to factor that in. You know, when you're like, and again, this is where like the business clinics, the local enterprise office, and all these people would know far more than me. But to put value on that time and and make sure you you know you pay yourself or you're able to you're able to charge the premium at which you're you are paying yourself. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot of people have unique strengths and competitive advantages uh, based on maybe with their farm process. You know, sure. they might have specific crops or their land is suitable yeah. for crops or, or maybe livestock as well. Or, and maybe proximity to markets and the specialized skills that may be in an area as well that might put, give you that advantage in terms of developing the business. Um, just in, turn, in terms of the market demand and the trends, would you just talk to us about that? Or is there a lot of change at the moment in consumer trends, consumer demand? At the moment. Yeah, I think it, it'll depend on on it, it, sometimes it can be a little bit regional. Um, you know, sometimes there's no point in saying that you know affluence doesn't come into it for certain types of products and and that kind of thing. I think I suppose with the artisan and the local produce, you know, you you have that that you already have that that marketing piece. You know, you have that. You know, you, you, you we see it all the time. Atlantic sea salt, or you know, you, all the you, things that you can whatever you can do to promote your own area. Um, you know, if, if, if you can, like I, I talked to you, I know it's very, like at the very start, they're talking about the labeling. If you can make these labeling claims, which I would imagine a lot of farm producers would, would certainly qualify. Um, that's, that's a good step for sure. Yeah. And, you know, how would you go about identifying potential gaps, you know, that, that maybe they're in a market, you know, that your farm could address? I suppose a lot of people yeah. probably other countries and they might see a gap in the market but is there any kind of way of identifying yeah. those um yeah i suppose i suppose, yeah it's good i think i think you know it's good to even not even that you'd have to travel to other countries maybe you could travel to other counties and see what's what's kind of being offered locally i mean the like the farmers market as i mentioned they're just talking about catherine and, and a lot of people you know sometimes you have people literally just kind of coming up saying do you supply this is there anywhere i can get this you know if you're talking to to local you know shops or farm shops you know is there is there kind of anything there that people are asking for um is there anything you you might hear from other producers it's great to kind of get into these these networking or these business networking kind of events or or you know you know i suppose groups and people say well you know i actually i i i, I used to get you know milk from this person but now he's not farming anymore and you say well i can supply that now or you know so i suppose it's, i suppose it's reaching out um i suppose seeing trends I would say it's, it's no harm. I know even like on the Foodworks program, they go over to to the UK and look at the kind of, um, you know, what's kind of available in, in in sort of the shops over there that maybe we don't have over here. Um, so just keeping that eye out, I suppose, is is good and keeping the eyes and ears to the ground on it all. You find there's a lot of secrecy there, Deirdre, in terms of people sharing information. Like I know there's some people producing ice cream, some people producing cheese. 
Is it is there a lot of secrecy or do people share knowledge with one another do you find within the industry? Um I, I think I think the small producers are good um are good are be- are probably better for sharing than than the than the bigger ones for sure. I've kind of worked in both industries. Um I think, you know, I certainly see it with the likes of the, the Irish farmhouse cheesemakers, like they have a great association where they, you know, where they get together and share, you know, needs and, and, and wants and, and, you know, network really, really well that way. So I, I definitely think the, the, the small producers are, are, are kind of better that way. And it, it's going to be person dependent as well, of course. But I, I think I think there's good. I think they, they tend to have if you have kind of the same common goals in producing this this good local food and you know a lot of people are i suppose they're supplying more locally than they are kind of internationally and so in, in this type of food um so i think you know it's if you if you see what's happening in other areas i think it's it, like i think we need to like look take a look at say the vending machines and the refillable milks and stuff like there's probably no point in you setting that up if, if next door is doing it but there's certainly i think there, there's a great need for one in every kind of in, in in every area you know that's kind of that's kind of you know i think yeah you, you would there's I, an, yeah. there is a network of cheese of cheese producers i think it's cost because it are cost yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, that's that's a fairly good network and uh, and it's not maybe too many cheese producers in the country would there be, would there be 40 or 50 cheese producers yeah there'd there? be 50 plus i think you know you're probably looking at 30 or so kind of you know i suppose bigger kind of producers you know um yeah but yeah, I think there's over fifty. There's about around in around the fifty. So, um, they, they, you know, they as a, as a group of small producers, like they have come together and formed that association and, and help each other out. And you know, we mm-hmm. we're actually we, we do we do support them. We're hosting their Irish the, the, their cheese awards judging next week, and you know, just help. We do try and help groups like that out if we can. You know, we're giving them you know access to our conference centers and things like that. Yeah, and um, um, so. so- is there networks? Is there networks there of other um, producers, like maybe the ice cream in, in in that area as well? I am not sure bread, on that one. Yeah, bread, bread producers or anyone like that. There's no networks um, there. I'm not sure. There probably is. I'm, I'm not not off the top of my head now. I'm involved with any of them, but um, we certainly would have. I suppose are different kind of researchers that would be involved in different different working groups and things like that for sure. I'm, I'm on all the different types of products. I find it always good that if you're developing a new product like that or if you're going into agri-tourism or different areas, it's good to stay in a place or maybe see existing premises that are already doing what you're thinking of doing. I'm yeah. just thinking here, if you're considering, you know, producing something new and you're looking at the feasibility of it, you're looking at the, at the scalability of it or maybe yeah. the, <clears throat> excuse me, the profitability of it, how do you try and align that with what you're trying to do? You know, how do you go about doing that? Um, is, there, is there people that, that service in terms of consultants out there at the moment that, that people can lean on or yeah is, is that do you help out in part yeah we, could, we, we, we can help out so it, it, it could be it'll depend on what route you go so i suppose um the likes of say the mentors in the local enterprise office you know that that they're they're people that might be able to help with that ourselves i suppose we try to you know if we get people on our sites using our kind of equipment and you know we, i'd have a lot of customers they come down and they'd be you know or, or feel free to take pictures of, of everything that you're using and you know even down to down to our cleaning products you know they come down they take a look and um, they try and take what they've learned home with them and um, you know we can certainly you know kind of give people guidelines on what kind of equipment they would need you know for certain I suppose for certain products like you know for, for say ice cream or something like that you know there's probably there's four main pieces of equipment I would always tell people they need um, and they can go in and kind of price them and this, that and the other, you know. So um, if we can help, we will. It, it, well, it depends on, on the request, really. And um, there's a lot of things people can do at home with, you know, certainly on, on what I do on there. So there's a lot of people, a, a couple of good tanks will do a lot for a lot of different food products. So um, if you have a, a tank that you can heat and cool, you know, you can make, you can make, you can pasteurize, you can make milk, ice cream, yogurt, you can do it all in the one time, maybe different days of the week. But um, sometimes it is just small scale investment, you know. Sometimes it's, it's obviously it's a lot bigger. And it's important to reiterate what you mentioned in the presentation. You mentioned about the BA Innovator and the more parts. Yeah. Of There's lots of pilot uh, kitchens there where you can actually go and test your product um, at the moment. So if you want to develop a bread, develop a chutney or a preserve or a jam, yeah. you can buy it out in those kitchens with the right equipment. And maybe yeah. then scale, scale the whole thing up afterwards once you've perfected yeah. what you want, want to do. Yeah. So just talk to us a bit more about that. About uh, I, I, the, I went to the Open Day at BA there last week and it was absolutely fantastic what they've achieved there. And yeah. it's a fantastic thing. 
Um, and I know you can do that in Moor Park as well, uh, can't you? The, something similar. Um, I would say B is probably more set up definitely for the kind of day to day production for small companies, for sure. We are kind of more, I suppose, it's pilot plant sort of stuff in, in Moor Park and Ashdown. Like it probably, you, you can certainly come in. I said, we're, we're there to get people off the ground. It, it wouldn't pay you to come in every day and pay the kind of rates that the, the factories would charge. But you could, you, the, your first couple of grants would cover it as such, maybe. And then you, you, you'd be kind of like, well, I'm developing these kind of prototypes. You know, even some people might come in and produce for a short period of time. We do have people producing out of Moor Park and Ashdown for sure, but it maybe it's it's not quite the kind of network that 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 uh, or the kind of setup that Bia has. But um, you can certainly come in and, and get this designed to get people off the ground. It's not designed for you to kind of stay there forever. Whereas the Bia is kind of um, short ter- short to kind of medium term um, production facilities, um, and you know, it, I suppose they they deal with every every kind of you know from very very start up to to kind of these growth kind of. Yeah, I suppose these businesses that are they're currently in kind of in growth phase. Um, so, there's, you know, there is slight differences between all the different um, different centres. And, you know, we, we collaborate a lot. You know, there's, I suppose, the biggest scale we have is in more Park Technology Limited. So, there, you know, there'd be even what you can achieve at BIA if you really, you, this, the biggest, you, if you wanted to scale it up further, you'd probably be looking at coming down to more Park, to be honest, you know. So it, yeah. um, it depends on what, on what you're doing. Everything is so different. Like we take things on a case-by-case basis. You know, we, we often have to mix the match. Like I spoke about Anne-Marie um, there um, with her, her beetroot. So we're working on her beetroot pulp at the minute. And, you know, we're going to conduct a certain kind of trial in more Park and a, and a different kind of trial in Ashtown because that's, those are the best places, best fit to do it and we're going to compare the two products and you know kind of go from there so it's it we have that network with you know connected to each other and that's 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 important i think you know it, you don't have to you're not limited to whoever you contact you're not limited to to that center we can you know i i've often gone up to ashtown with my clients um to do things like packaging trials and stuff like that because that's not really my area but there's some great people up there working on that um but i know enough about it to bring my client up there and spend the day you know doing a trial up there um, so, you know, we, we have that flexibility across all the centres as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in your presentation there about, you know, the evaluating the regulatory and the legal considerations. Um, and yeah. that can be done by a lot of people <clears throat> because I might be, you might be good in the in the kitchen in terms of making your chutneys, yeah. making your breads. But when it yeah. comes to the regulatory and the legal requirements associated with maybe producing and maybe marketing uh, and add, adding value to, to your products, it might be... It might be uh, a step too far for some people. Can you just give us some advice in that area, please? Yeah. So I suppose I suppose it is. You know, it's that initial phase that's difficult. You know, um, and not that it's, it's not too difficult, but it's daunting. I think is is probably the word for people who don't have maybe that as I said maybe that kind of scientific background. So I would say like people say, oh, the inspector, the inspector, they think it's it's a negative thing. Like these people want you to succeed and want you to produce good safe and healthy food so you know it, it's I think it, it's having the attitude of working together with them so they, they at the end of the day they are going to be and you know there's different inspectors for different areas and um, you're going to have to you know there might be some individualities there so you you know you're going to want to work with who your I suppose who your designated inspector is and um, I would say think of it as a partnership don't think of it as, as any sort of opposition they're there to make sure your your food you know nobody wants to be producing food that's not up to scratch or not you know compliant so I think um they should be there I know we have had we had a fantastic um um department uh, dairy controls division inspector Finbar um in Moor Park and he you know he says we're here to help you know so that's that's you know I think you, you need to kind of have that attitude as well that you're there to cooperate um and as I said take a look at the website and see what what it does um you know what what it might entail as as the first few steps um I know I do know some people I you know if you're only making maybe small small batches or a small amount of product which you know a lot of people in this industry it's not this big it's not doesn't have to be this overly complicated food safety plans and so on um a lot of people do engage with the likes of food safety consultants because you know if you really really don't have this background and you really aren't you know you know a, a few hours of an expert's time could maybe save you a couple of weeks you know they can do up these hassle plans for you and so on as long as you understand them um and you know you will be required to probably do these hassle courses and so on so as long as you will kind of understand why you're you know you're cleaning things a certain way or why you're putting in these control steps and all that kind of thing i think as time goes on you'll understand them more and more um it's just at that at the start it can be a little bit daunting so i would say just kind of persevere with it seek whatever help you need to and just you know work in collaboration with your with your your kind of authority on it 
And would you generally have an EHO or an environmental health officer calling out to your farm maybe a couple of times a year? Could you get sporadic inspections like that if you're producing? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, they, I think they, they guarantee once a year, I think, is a guarantee. Um, um, they don't tend to, to, to be out um, if they're kind of happy with what you're doing. Um, I don't think they don't tend to be to be knocking on your door, you know, a lot. I think it'll depend on who it and, is as well, Department of Ag or, or EHO. They, they can, I think they have the right to, to do that, you know, but they, they generally tend to announce when they're coming and, 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 and give you that kind of heads up as well. Um, if you, I think what's important, I think it's, it's that startup phase. If, if, if you've participated, if you've, I suppose, collaborated with them well at the start and have put your right measures in place, you know, they'll be confident in, in, in your premises, then um, you're looking at your probably yearly inspections they might have to come back out if they found something they, you know they, they might not shut you down but they might say you know there's something here that I'd like rectified within a couple of weeks or something like that and then they will come back to you but that's I think that's that's normal and, and, and fair enough and what would they look for like in terms of food safety do, do they do they look yeah. for record keep yeah so um first of all I suppose if you're if you're producing out of a farm you're going to have to have a suitable premises so they, they'll you know I suppose from an early um from an early 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 on that you, you'll have there's requirements around your floors your ceilings your lighting your hand washing hot water cold water so there will be like again I'm not certainly not the expert in this but I, I just know from from dealing with other people that um there will be kind of a, a short list of things that they will insist on and then depending on your process like if you want to be a raw milk producer you will have to get a special license for that um you know if you're just if you're pasteurizing milk you know there's there's a lot less um i suppose there's if you're just producing milk versus producing i suppose um value added like the cheese the yogurt that becomes a different kind of inspector and a different inspectorate um and then you, you then you're starting to have to put your 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 plan in place for your your production plan so your 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 prerequisite program and your HACCP plan so they'll be just looking to see that you're you're cleaning things properly um that you have this maybe this cooking or pasteurization step to kill any bacteria if that's what you're doing um you know are you packaging it you know into kind of you know are you separating your your wet stuff from your dry stuff are you separating your packaging from you know your your food area you know different just different things like segregation and um just really really common sense stuff it, it is all really really common sense stuff. they're not they're not going to ask you to um you know i suppose reinvent any wheel it's just kind of basic basic things hand washing personal protection equipment you know you know um over shoes like really really basic things and it is good it is good to go uh, you you mentioned you touched on it there earlier it is go, good to see if you can just go and see someone else who's doing something similar to you and um, you know appeal to their better nature treat it like you're going in, they'll treat you like you're anybody coming into their premises you know you'd have to gown up put on your you know put on your um your your personal protective equipment wash your hands all these things um and just have a look and see what that process is in in other food food production facilities and it's likely that yours is going to be very very similar yeah and there is there is reputational consequences for this as well Deirdre isn't there because nowadays with social media if if somebody fails an EHO test that that information may go online and may damage the reputation of the bill of the business so you're mitigate those risks as well by making sure that you're meeting all the food safety requirements yeah, you know it's it's it, they're there for a reason and you know it, it's it's in your own interest i suppose as well to to comply with all these things there you know you don't want these product recalls or anything yeah. like that down the line and um, they can be certainly very very damaging i think minor you know minor discrepancies are certainly would never get would never get on any website or anything like that it would be more the bigger thing so you know don't worry if everything's not absolutely perfect um you know but you, you need to you know, have that 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 approach that you're going to aim tug at everything perfect. You know, eventually. Um, you mentioned there about product recall. Um, you know, about what? Sorry. You you mentioned about product potential product recall or uh, issues like that. Is there insurance yeah. to mitigate against that? And what? Just talk to us a, a wee. Sorry, Barry, lost you altogether. A bit about the requirement for insurance on a facility in your supply like that. Hello? Yeah, yeah so sorry. If you I, just I, I talk totally to lost you there. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you just talked to us about insurance and the requirement for insurance around maybe product recall or public liability, all of that, please. Yeah, well, I, I don't know too much about it, to be honest, but you, you will have to have your, your premises insured and... and 
you know, obviously, and especially even if you're going to to farmers markets and stuff like that, you'll have to have this public liability insurance and stuff. I, again, I'm, I'm really not, yeah. not I don't know too much yeah. important that, but it is important, you know, for sure. Maybe we just talk a bit about labelling because I know that we, we talked about food safety and compliance, but labelling yeah. is, there is compliance associated with labelling as well. Is there, can you give any yeah. advice? Um, advice on that. Okay, so, you know, like we, someone, people like ourselves would be, you know, again, we're not we're not the, the regulation around a regulatory body around labeling or anything like that, but we could certainly help. Um, you know, we can probably tell from a formulation what your label is going to say. Um, just the basic maths around what you're what you're kind of putting into a product and you know how much you know water's in there and what and this, that and the other, anything that you're adding. Um, you know, if, if there's any any questions, do do feel free to reach out and we, we do have some so I definitely have some we have a um an expert in, in in labeling in our department as well so i have directed a few queries through her um it's you know there is basic there is on the food safety target website and even on our our rural economy website that i that i highlighted there in the in the webinar there is you know some basic fact sheets on labeling um you know you, it's quantity you know you, you'll be you'll be declaring what's in your product based on the quantity that's in there and then if you're making any claims these there, there will be there will be regulations around whether you can make that claim or not. So it really will will, will depend on your product. But I think the the kind of the, the small scale the artisan producers, you know, these they're they're fairly usually fairly simple enough products. They're usually pretty easy in terms of the labeling. Um, you know, for something like a yogurt or a cheese, you're looking saying milk starter cultures. It's it's really, um, you know, simple in a lot of ways. You know, we try we try not to overcomplicate it. We can also, you know, what people do as well is we can send out, you know, we, we don't do it ourselves all the way, but sometimes we do, but it depends on what the product is, but we can send out samples for analysis. So you can, and we can advise on where to send your samples and how to get your, your final composition and your, I suppose, your, 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 your micro quality if you're testing for anything like residue, anything like that. We would have all those, those kind of um, contacts and, 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 and experts in charts as well that can, that can kind of help, help and advise with that. Okay. A question here. I wanted to produce smoked seafood products and have been finding it quite difficult to try to find courses for that skill. Are there courses that Be An Innovator provides? Um, that's specific, or, or maybe anybody, Deirdre, that you know of? Yeah, not that I know of. Um, it's something I can certainly direct direct towards Bia because they do have um, the seafood kitchen as well. Um, so yeah. that's... That's something I, I can if, if that if that person wants to contact me directly I can I can put put them in touch with with the, uh, the, the the relevant people if that if that's any um, help to that person. Yeah. Okay. Another question here: Can I grow veg and sell it from the farmyard gate and be compliant with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland? Um, as not entirely sure. As far as you will probably still have to have your vendor's license or so whatever kind of comes with that. Um, you know, I suppose look into that from, um. Just check out their, their website and see what what license you will need and what are the stipulations around that. I think something as simple simple as you know fresh vegetables certainly won't won't have the same um, regulations as as a, a you know I suppose a highly um, processed product or so on. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of people inquiring about craft beverages now. Um, you know they have access maybe to fruit orchards or maybe yeah. uh, I should go and maybe, maybe into craft beverage production whether it's cider or wine or fruit based. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of supports are available for uh, for for that process? Yeah, I suppose. Um, uh, just I suppose I touched on it there as well in the seminar. We have, I suppose, our fermentation um, expert is is John Leach in Moorpark, and then we would have our brewing expert Lisa Ryan in, in Oak Park and Carlo. So if I get queries like that, I'd probably be either liaising with those guys myself or directing people to them, depending on the nature of of, of what people want to do or what project. Okay, um, a question there for an air dry beef. Where is the best place to go? Yeah, yeah, and that would be our Ashtown. So our we would have um, there's there's some great meat scientists up in in our Ashtown centre in in other programs and also within our own department. So I would I would direct people, um, if again if somebody wants to contact me directly, I can forward on their query to the relevant people if that's. Yeah. So Another yeah, we kind of suppose the centre and yeah, go. On. And, and and Ashton also have um have a slaughtering course there as well, don't they? Is it a three have or four day slaughtering? Oh a yeah, beef, they have different beef. they have different um um butchering courses, yeah, yeah, as well. So 
Um, the cheese making course is run by Chagas. How frequently are they run? They are run every two years. Okay, so we kind of run that. That's kind of a big course. Um, it's QQI certified. We run it kind of pretty much at cost. So we kind of wait till we get a full, a full, a full classroom, if that makes sense. But yeah, regardless, we run it every two years. Um, so yeah, so it is. It you know, it's it's actually only three days on site, but there is other things associated with it, exams and assignments and so on. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we, we try to condense the amount of time people are away from their farm and, and all that thing. We want it, we tend to run it in the winter time when I suppose cows are dried off and that kind of thing. We tend to run it sort of, you know, maybe November ish time or something like that. Um, so we, we just ran it last November. So the next one is likely to be next winter. Okay. And other areas like chocolate making or um, bread making, are there specific courses that can be organized if people have an interest in those areas as well? Yeah, I thought it's always, um, again, you saw it there on the link to the, to the website, if you go into our food industry training website, um, I suppose in-house courses or, you know, I suppose product specific courses, stuff like that. There is kind of contact details there. Um, it's always, you know, I suppose good to, to reach out. There definitely, there definitely, we do have staff that do kind of in-company training um, different different areas. So um, it's certainly I would encourage people to come along and ask anyway and, and see if it's possible and how much mm. it will cost and that kind of thing. So, Okay. Um, a question here about, can you discuss the importance of branding and marketing in terms of farm-based produce? Can I just, um, okay. I, I suppose it'll depend on where you're, where you're selling. Um, if there's a, if there's something, unique about your your area if you have or you have like a you know a, a kind of a certain kind of herd of cows or you have you know if there's something that you want to to kind of you want people to know about then i certainly is, is a good selling point i would say um you know if you're just kind of selling directly to people and to you know to in farmers markets or you know you're, you're stocking farm shops yourself that kind of thing um you probably it's probably, maybe it's not as important because these people know you or they or people know your story or local people know who you are um, and you're actually you're telling them directly yourself but if, if you're kind of going bigger i suppose well, the bigger you go the more important that it would be would be probably my message there i suppose if you want to stand out there during the market you, yeah. really, you, should, you really need to be developing a good brand and a good marketing uh, strategy around your product that's it yeah for sure and again it's not you know, it's not something we do for sure, but it is something we see and it's something local enterprise office can help you with. And as you grow, um, you know, they're kind of ex the food accelerator programs, things like that. That's that's what they all deal with. They deal with fantastic stuff like that. The food academy, the food accelerator programs. And, um, you know, as if you were to continue to grow and go through food works or, or get get big enough for board BA to take you on as a client, you know, all this is when when it, this is where you get massive supports and all that um but i suppose starting out again starting out can be difficult i'm not going to say that it isn't um for all this i suppose the bigger you get the more you know the more you kind of deal with you know i suppose b um, bigger players and you kind of get to see what's needed and and so on but starting out can be a bit daunting i think if, if if you're willing to kind of i suppose if you're willing to kind of I suppose leverage or maybe pay for kind of a, 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 I think your local enterprise office would be a great place anyway they, they can advise on this side side of things um some people do then go and kind of maybe leverage pay for you know a little bit of consultation with and we would we would certainly have some contacts in that area as well um yeah that really help out small producers yeah I suppose uh, some people have asked about farmer supports as well I just wanted to mention the option programs that that's available through Chagas as well farmers or land developing a new product, a better understanding how they can turn their idea into a, a viable business. So um, there's, we, we sometimes have mentors available for individuals to help them with their idea and maybe to introduce individuals, maybe to other agencies or parties who are able to you know offer assistance there for very specific projects. And the program, the options program runs generally in the back end of the year from September to December. So it's, it's targeted at farmers who are trying to improve their farm income and diversify into a new area. So it could be food or it could be agri-tourism. Um, and all areas are covered from renewables to rural tourism to food. Uh, we'd have the likes of yourself just speaking at those courses and uh, other people within the food uh, the, the, the development unit within Tagus as well. You know, it could be um, looking at assessing your enterprise, developing a business plan. And we work quite a bit with the with the LEOs, the local enterprise offices across the country on a regional basis and running those courses. So they're delivered over 
maybe five or six nights in the winter time of the year for over three hour period and guest farmers who successfully diversified, they'd be asked to come in and speak at those workshops as well, uh, along, uh, along with Chaga specialists. So if anyone wants any more information on, on those, you can go to the Chagas website uh, on Rural Economy, uh, on the Rural Development website, and you can see about the Chagas Options Programme and you can express an interest in attending a course or contact your local Chagas office if you can attend a, a course there as well. So Deirdre, we've um, had lots of questions there for you. I just uh, we just want to wrap up and I want to uh, thank you and, uh, you know, for sharing your expertise and your insights with us today. You have a wealth of knowledge in this area and you've given us great uh, guidance in unlocking the artisanal potential on the farms. I also want to thank our, our listeners here today for your participation and your insightful questions as well. So as we wrap up, I want to encourage you to continue exploring the possibilities for adding value to the food produced in your farms, whether it's through innovative products or sustainable practices or strategic partnerships. There's countless opportunities waiting to be seized. So Chagas is here to support you on that journey towards a more uh, prosperous and sustainable farm business. So don't hesitate to contact us for guidance. I will be putting up Deirdre's presentation on the website afterwards so you can get all those links again afterwards and uh, along with this a recorded presentation um so so thanks again for viewing online and thanks to Deirdre uh, for her presentation and uh, goodbye and take care